Oh, it's you again. Welcome back to the continuation where I cover every single Shaman King spinoff. Today I'm looking at a prequel manga, Shaman King Zero. This one is set up to where there's several chapters where it follows all the main characters in small little side stories, all before the events of the big Shaman King tournament. We start off with Yo, who's just a widow bitty boy who hasn't started his true destiny quite yet, and is still wondering what the world is like when you're a shaman. And he's doing what he always does, talk to spirits as he mopes around trying to come to terms with his inevitable and domineering future. And the truth is, Yo is in a stage of his life where he's alone. He's ostracized by society because he can see spirits when no one else can. At this point in time, he truly feels like he hates everyone around him. And he thought of him becoming Shaman King as horrifying since he's convinced that if he does attain that sort of power, he'd use it to destroy everyone. And this was lightly touched in the main series, but it's now being fully explored in this two volume prequel. There's only only two, which was a lot easier for me. I was kind of nice after the main series, reading all 35 volumes, I needed a break. Manta was important to Yo because Manta was really like the, the first person to treat Yo normally because Yo was ostracized by society. But now we get to see him before Yo adopted that lackadaisical attitude that he always has. The problem is that usually you'd think that his grandfather, the one training him, would chastise him and get Yo's head on straight. But Yo has to accept what's going to happen himself. If others just keep telling him what to do, his heart won't really be into his training. He needs to learn why his training is important to him and not to anyone else. Which is really difficult when you're being bullied at school on a daily basis. And Yo has the problem where he knows he can seriously hurt the people bullying him, but simply can't do anything because he knows there's a good chance he'll go overboard. So he just has to take the beating every time. That bully who's been picking on Yo decides to tell the owner of the train station about that spirit he's been talking to. And so the owner decides that the spirit needs to be exercised or it'll hurt his business. And so Yo's grandfather is the one who has to do the exorcism. Luckily, Yo decides that there's nothing he can really do to stop his grandfather, but instead of sulking and getting angry, he found that girl's fiance so that they could see each other one more time and her fiance uses Yo's body to play them one more song before they pass on. And that's when Yo started to have a change of heart. Maybe he still hated people, but he started doing what he could for the spirits who were still earthbound. Next, we move on to Ren. Funny enough, you find out that the one girl's fiance that played music for everyone, um, well, turns out he died out when he went to war and Ren is the one that killed him, because, you know, Ren is a murderous, selfish little twat. Ren is nine years old and being trained to kill his emotions so that he can be the head of the Tao family. There's nothing really exciting in Ren's chapter, other than, you know, getting a look at his mindset where, uh, what, killing off your emotions is somehow tantamount to death or something, that's how he words it? But whatever, it's not important. Next, we move on to Horo Horo. What I didn't cover in my main video about the Shaman King main series manga is that Horo Horo belongs to the Usui tribe, and when he was younger, uh, they were about to get flooded because there's a damming company that's about to be redirecting all the water to their tribe. The only issue is that he's friends with the damning company's CEO's daughter, and because her father plans to literally wipe out Horohoro's tribe and destroy pretty much all of the nature they protect, she's despised by literally everyone. Horohoro shows Damko, the, the girl he's friends with, the field of Butterbur. Horohoro explains to her that the Butterbur fields are precious to him, because ever since his mom and his friends disappeared, the Butterbur field is the only place he can really feel at peace. He tells her that the Usui tribe that he belongs to are putting a great weight on him, that they think he'll somehow save the Usui tribe from dying off. But he knows that he can't stop progress, he can't stop the times from changing, and so he's given up without even really trying. Damko is the one who convinces him that if you protect something, if you really care about something, it'll never truly die. Only for the very next day, 
he finds his Butterbur fields destroyed. And Horohoro starts convincing himself that Domko was just distracting him so that he wouldn't see it happen. That he was being used by her. And in the Kanzenban, excuse me, they fill in what happened. Horohoro started pushing Domko away because he felt betrayed. And when Horohoro ran away, you have any idea how hard it is for me to say Horohoro? That's one heck of a name. Anyway, when he, when Horo Horo ran away, Damko followed him into the forest, got lost, and eventually died of hyperthermia, hypothermia. That's the one where you die of cold, hypothermia. They only found her body after the snow had melted away. And Horo Horo ends up blaming himself. And since he's filled with such regret, that he tries to kill himself by jumping off the dam that Domko's father built. A member of the Yosui tribe catches him, and that's how Horohoro became obsessed with becoming Shaman King. He's working to atone for the grief he's carrying. And if you're familiar with the events in the main manga, you know that Kororo, the spirit companion of Horohoro, is actually Domko. She's just been made into a nature spirit because she wanted to stay with Horohoro on his journey. And I'm glad they went deeper into Horohoro's character. I keep saying they, it's one person, it's, it's Hiroyuki Take. I don't, I'm probably gonna keep saying they because it makes me feel better. Because in the main series, you could tell that Horohoro was really struggling with something and they did explore it a little bit, but it was never really well developed. It was more just smashed in there and it, just to, you know, give the audience something for a character that probably got surprisingly high on the popularity polls. So fleshing out his character in this prequel manga really helps with his character. But that's kind of what backstories do. Next, we move on to Lycerg. And what better way to start off his story than just three years after Lycerg saw Hao burn his parents alive. Now Lycerg is adopted by some count who has so much money he decided to start taking an orphan to children. He spends a lot of his time with his roommate named Watt. W-A-T, it's a weird name I know. Lycerg and Watt decide to make a little detective agency so that Lycerg can train his shamanic skills for the upcoming shaman fight. Watt ends up being late, Lycerg doesn't really know where he went, and later that day, Watt comes home, only now he's a spirit. You find out that the Count that adopted him is the one that killed Watt. Turns out he's a slave trader who sells little boys, and Watt found out, so he just went and murdered him. And Lycerg, being the deeply troubled and now deeply pissed off little kid that he is, takes the guns from the Count's goonies and gets ready to kill him. But Watt tries to convince Lycerg not to kill. And Watt tells Lycerg that the reason Watt became an orphan is because he murdered his abusive parents. And even though he knew that the Count was a slave trader, being given a home and food was the first time in his life he was happy. While Watt is telling Lycerg all of this, the Count picks up some guns and shoots Lycerg. I know it might be a shock to you, but Lycerg ended up surviving. And you also find out that how later on burned the Count in the slave trade that he was running. So Lycerg never knew what happened, but it didn't really matter. And the lesson Lycerg learns isn't that hate will only make you sad. It wasn't that he learned to practice love. He learned that he was weak. So weak, in fact, that he couldn't even protect his own friend. Which, you know, thank goodness, because it was starting to sound like Watt was trying to convince Lycerg to spare the Count. Even though the Count is a slave trader? Lycerg decides, nah, I just need to get stronger. That's the takeaway I'm gonna get from this. That stuff was messed up. Lycerg's story didn't really feel like it gave any insight into his character. It just gave a slightly more justification about why when you know, Yo and the gang first meet him, why he's so obsessed with getting stronger and why he's so reckless in the main manga and so willing to join what is obviously a cult, but okay. Which I feel, you know, all that didn't really need further justification, but okay. Anyway, here's a little bit of Howe's backstory. As you should already know, Howe was abandoned as a pup, but instead of being found by a sweet old lady in the middle of nowhere, a bunch of Onmyoji are sort of trying to help him because Howe's mere existence is bringing about a bunch of demons and malicious spirits. And this dude with the nose that's also part of his forehead holds the Shikigami Zenki and Goki. 
And so, because they find out how can control demons, he basically gets adopted and given fancy clothes, and begins his training to become an Onmyoji himself. And deep in a mysterious cave is a man who hates the nose forehead guy because forehead man surpassed him and played political favorites to get it good with the emperor. He knows that there's going to be a ritual performed in front of the emperor to banish the demons from the capital, and if he messes it all up, then he's pretty sure he'll get his revenge. And he plans to employ the help of Forehead Man's original apprentice, because that kid is pissed off that his master brought in Hao, so he's very willing to screw things up to make Hao look bad. But remember, Hao can read minds, and Hao just flat out tells him that he knows his plan and that he thinks it's a bad idea. Not because it'll make him look bad, but because Forehead Man is so freaking powerful that not even Hao can read his mind. And so, they have a little chat. Hao tells him that after being ostracized from society and having to murder people at such a young age, hearing the true thoughts of the most wicked people, that he's come to terms that people can really only live for themselves. And how he knows his desire to wipe out humanity is also a very human goal, and that he desperately wants to exceed humanity, becoming more than human. And so, the demon banishment ritual comes, and just as planned, they release a bunch of demons on the party to try and make Forehead Man look bad. And he springs into action, ready to protect his emperor, only to kill his old apprentice. Turns out, Forehead Man and that creepy dude from the cave actually planned to kill him this whole time, because his original apprentice was a Shikigami in human form. And from the body of his now dying apprentice, a new spirit coalesces and forms, what they call the supercorporeal demon, only to be immediately stepped on and squashed beneath its massive form. And seeing the Onmyoji's wicked ways, how they would double-cross their own apprentice, and seeing how corrupt the Emperor was, how takes the talisman from his former master, and acquires his Shikigami, Zenki Ngoki, and begins to fight the massive corporeal demon. Letting himself be stabbed, Hao now has a physical connection with the corporeal demon, and so, in his near-dying state, all the demons Hao carries inside him can flow directly into it by force, and successfully manages to kill the spirit of his friend, leaving behind the corporeal demon to serve under Hao, thus acquiring the high spirit of fire born of betrayal and hatred. And after saving the capital, Hao is granted the rank of Great Onmyoji. I don't really understand how the High Spirit can be born from someone, or maybe it was like the merging of so many demons into one human form that formed the High Spirit of Fire, or maybe the High Spirit was always possessing the apprentice? I'm not really sure. Anyway, I love seeing more of Hao's origin. I mean, typically everyone likes to see origins of villains, so, you know, this was probably gonna be one of the favorites, just because that's typically how it goes. Villains are really cool. And seeing how he acquired Zenki and Goki, the two Shikigami that eventually Anna later acquired, is a cool way to tie it into the main series. Especially since Anna's still my favorite character. <laughs> Even if it's a little confusing about how the Spirit of Fire is supposed to work, uh, I, or if, you know, it's just intentionally left vague. Regardless, Hao's story is probably the most compelling in this series. Like, the two-volume series, the prequel series. But now we move on to a character which basically had no character development whatsoever. Sati. Haha. <laughs> Sati is 13 years old, traveling through India. Sati, during this time, traveled with several, well, travelers. And they never have any money, and they're always hungry because they don't really know what they're doing. And so they find the place of who they heard is a generous Maharaja. And they go up to him and ask for some money and some lodging. And he's just like, sure, cool, no problem. But only if Sati, whom, may I remind you, is still 13 at this time, becomes his wife. And because they're all desperate, Sati kind of agrees, or just goes along with it. And you think that this Maharaja is just some dude who wants a massive harem, which he does, in fact. But you just, you find out that he, he keeps partying and marrying people so that he can party more, only so that he can forget about how he lost his family. It's just a really, really bad coping method that he develops. And so Sati determines herself to beat it out of him. 
sick of him trying to buy love so that he could forget his woes. And so the Maharaja summons his spirit ally to do battle with Sati, knowing full well that Sati has a multitude of spirit allies ready to fight. But Sati has no idea what he's talking about and freaks out. So her big troop of travelers join in to stop the Maharaja from going overboard. And since Sati has no idea what's going on, her traveling companions explain to her that every day, when Sati was praying, she was actually bringing bodhisattvas into oversouls. She had no idea she had shamanic powers and just thought she was praying. And they proceed to beat the ever-living crap out of him. And then he tells them that his family isn't actually dead, they just got sick of him and left. But now his mindset changed, and his heart purified. He decides to follow Sati in hopes of finding true love specifically with Sati. But of course, Sati isn't really into it, and he, but he ends up joining them anyway. And now Sati's traveling troop has a super rich Maharaja strutting around with them. They don't need to worry about money anymore. Also, if you're weirded out by the fact that I add a little phlegm to Maharaja, that's just how I pronounce it. I'm very aware that's probably not how I should pronounce it, but that's just what my throat does, so I'm sorry. And Sati never married him because he is super creepy. And I'm glad we got to learn more about Sati, especially since in the main series, she was really just introduced to move the plot along, which, you know, isn't bad, but sometimes you need characters to do that, but they kind of, when you hype someone up like that, it just kind of hurts when you don't do anything with it. Now she has, you know, <laughs> actual character. It was probably really easy to, you know, make a good backstory for Sati just because there was just nothing to her in the main series. So the backstory for Sati was also decently compelling. I like how Hiroyuki Take likes to incorporate all forms of quote unquote shamanism from, you know, all different kinds of cultures, you know, loosely shamanism. And I learned new words which is always fun. Now there are some stories that I skipped over mostly because they were either really short and didn't actually have any you know, insight to any of the characters or they were just small little gags made for fun and it's not really something worth covering in a video. Or it was a spinoff, like, like a prequel, like one shot spinoff to an upcoming series for a video that I'm gonna cover. And if it is relevant, then I'll cover it in the later video. But otherwise, it, I don't think it's gonna be relevant. I still need to read Shaman King Flowers to see if it is relevant. So if you really wanna know, just read Shaman King Zero. Shaman King Zero is definitely something that, you know, allowed Hiroyuki Take to flesh out the characters that he definitely rushed through in the main series. Specifically, Horohoro and Sati. We probably didn't need that How story, even though it was really cool, but probably didn't, but still, it, it was just not really necessary. My guess is that this prequel was just as much for us as it was for Hiroyuki Take, especially since this was more or less him getting back into the game of Shaman King after like taking a break from the series for over a decade. He didn't stop making manga after he finished the main series of Shaman King, but yeah, he just hadn't touched the Shaman King property in forever. So this was, this was probably more for him than anything else. But that's all I have for this video. If you want to see my other Shaman King videos, be sure to subscribe to see what I cover next. You can follow me, you can subscribe to my Patreon if you want to see my videos months in advance sometimes, and also cool Patreon rewards. Or you can follow me on Twitter to brighten up your timeline, links in the description. Hope you enjoyed this video. Stay beautiful and keep playing.